Last week, we were studying Abraham's call to sacrifice his son Isaac. And we ended by saying that this very passage of scripture was the subject of the most famous art contest in history. It took place, you recall, in Florence, Italy in 1401 between the two final contestants, Filippo Brunelleschi and Lorenzo Ghiberti. The project was to produce a bronze panel depicting the sacrifice of Isaac and the winner would be given the illustrious job of designing all the panels for the two remaining sets of doors at the most important building, the baptistry, attached to the most important cathedral in Florence, Santa Maria del Fiore. These were the two panels submitted by the finalists in the competition, Brunelleschi on the left and Ghiberti on the right. Let's take a closer look at each one as we try to decide which one is the better of the two. Brunelleschi divides the action horizontally. The figure of Abraham leans into the action, forcefully gripping Isaac by the neck and thrusting his chin upwards with his thumb. The angel swoops in from the left and stops Abraham's action by gripping his arm with one hand and gesturing with the other to indicate the ram that will take Isaac's place. Below you see the donkey and the figures of the two servant boys who accompanied father and son into the wilderness. The figure of the boy on the left is modeled after a classical sculpture, Il Spinario, or the boy pulling a thorn. The original was from the Hellenistic era, and it was often copied by the Romans, first in bronze and then in marble, as you see here. It was a popular theme, and it was introduced into this competition to highlight the new interest in classical models that would become a hallmark of the Renaissance. The action in the upper half is raw and dramatic. Isaac's body is grotesquely twisted, his arms are bound behind him, and it almost seems that the knife wielded by Abraham has reached Isaac's neck. The eyes of the angel and Abraham meet, just as the command is given not to go through with the sacrifice. Ghiberti's entry into the competition is very different. He chose to divide his panel diagonally, with the flow of mountainous rock separating the two boys and the donkey on the left from the ram, the angel, and Abraham and Isaac on the right. Ghiberti also inserted a classical element. The torso of Isaac is modeled after a nude torso from the Roman era, and it's the first full-on nude torso to appear in art since the classical period. Scholars say that Brunelleschi's version of Isaac has him wearing a loincloth, but you could have fooled me. Be that as it may, the torso of Isaac is elegant and beautifully rendered. This is how a well-toned young male body should look. The drama is lessened when compared to Brunelleschi's work because the knife has not gotten close to Isaac's neck. Abraham is far more restrained and is in fact leaning away from his son, not rushing in upon him, as in Brunelleschi's version. The perfectly foreshortened angel coming in from outside the frame on the right does not have to grip Abraham's arm to avert the tragedy. A gesture toward the ram will suffice. And if you happen to be a cloth merchant, remember it was the Cloth Merchants Guild that sponsored this competition. The elegantly draped garment that Ghiberti has given Abraham with its beautifully decorated border, coupled with the robe that Isaac has gracefully displayed at the bottom of the altar, these items of clothing 
would probably be more pleasing, a better advertisement on the baptistry in Florence than the far more simplified garment that Brunelleschi's Abraham is wearing. Even the bit of cloth that's been wafted by a breeze into the air behind Abraham's head in Ghiberti's panel is rendered much more, shall we say, with a flourish, with brio, much more so than the more heavy-handed treatment of Brunelleschi. When you compare the two, Brunelleschi's panel seems a bit more cluttered, and in fact the two sculptors used very different techniques. Ghiberti made a cast from a single sheet of bronze. The only elements that were added separately were the torso of Isaac and the arm of Abraham in order to thrust them forward a bit and give them more relief. Brunelleschi cast six different elements separately and then soldered them onto the sheet of bronze a technique that used approximately 16 more pounds of bronze than Ghiberti's version, and bronze was expensive. The figures also seem to be placed rather awkwardly in the Brunelleschi panel. The eye jumps from one to the next, with no sense of what is most important to look at. Ghiberti introduced the flowing diagonal of the mountain and its rocks, which leads the eye down from the upper left and then upwards to where the more important action is taking place. We can look at the boys and the donkey on the left, which are nicely grouped together as a unit, but our focus is elsewhere because that is how Ghiberti designed his comp composition. Both panels were singled out by the judges for high praise and both can be seen today in the Bargello Museum in Florence. Both represented a new direction in art, an interest in the beauty of the human body, in proportion, and the ideals of the classical world. And they were also interested in a dynamic, naturalistic rendering of the world. So which panel do you like? Which do you think the judges picked as the better of the two? Well, for some of the reasons I've mentioned, I've sort of tilted the scales toward Ghiberti's panel, which is the one they chose. In addition to its elegance and its harmonious composition, it took much less bronze to create, which would matter a great deal when you consider the many panels that had to be cast for two sets of double doors and the cost of the bronze. And if you were a cloth merchant wanting to cast Florence's primary industry in the most favorable light, Ghiberti's version definitely tops Brunelleschi's. Brunelleschi was disappointed, it uh, has to be admitted, but it was all for the best. He gave up sculpture for good and set off to study the ancient monuments and architecture of Rome, in particular the Pantheon, with its enormous dome seen here from the outside and the inside looking up. His studies there led him to the discovery of linear perspective, as we studied in an earlier session, and led him to the creation of some of the most notable and brilliant monuments of the Renaissance. In fact, it is he who beat out Ghiberti in the competition for finishing the architectural work at Santa Maria del Fiore. And it was he who solved the enigma of how to construct the huge octagonal dome called for in the original architectural plan. The technological wizardry required to accomplish this feat had been lost since antiquity and the fall of Rome. He thus gave Florence its most well-known and universally admired architectural features. Meanwhile, 
Ghiberti worked on the baptistry doors for years and years. The third set of doors he produced for the cathedral was given the name The Gates of Paradise by none other than Michelangelo, who thought that their beauty was without equal. We'll take a look at them on another occasion, but I can't resist giving you a glimpse of the scene of the sacrifice of Isaac that Ghiberti created for those doors many years later. It encompasses on the left-hand side the vision of the three Trinitarian figures who came to tell Abraham about the birth of Isaac in a year's time, with Sarah hovering in the tent door behind. And on the right, we have the sacrifice, with donkey and servants below, and the trio of angel, Abraham, and Isaac above, along with the sacrificial ram. In the midst are the most glorious trees. You can't imagine that they're really cast in bronze. They seem so light, so gossamer, so airy, it kind of defies gravity. Now I'd be shirking my duty if I fail to comment on the Old Testament scripture for this Sunday, which concerns the marriage of Isaac and Rebekah in Genesis 24. In Genesis 23, Abraham's wife Sarah dies. In Genesis 24, Abraham sends his trusted servant Eliezer back to Mesopotamia and the region of Haran. You can just look for the green line on the map to follow Eliezer's journey. This is where the rest of Abraham's family is located, and it's here that Eliezer must find a suitable bride for Isaac. Abraham makes Eliezer swear that he will not choose a woman from among the Canaanite people in whose midst they're living, but from among his own people in Haran. When Eliezer arrives in Haran, he prays to the Lord for a sign that will indicate which young woman would make a suitable wife for Isaac. Standing by a spring of water, he prays that the young woman, excuse me, the young women of the area, as they approach, would hear him ask for a drink of water. And the one who offered him a drink of water, plus offered to water his camels, would be the one that must be chosen for Isaac. That was the sign, and that's exactly what happened. There aren't many images that capture this scene, but here's a beautiful painting by the French artist Nicolas Poussin, which does just that. Unfortunately, I couldn't find an image in really high resolution, so we'll have to make do with this. Poussin's patron had commissioned him to do a painting with a biblical subject that would show a number of beautiful women in various poses and with a variety of expressions. And Poussin chose the scene of Eliezer and Rebecca meeting at the well. You can see that it's designed almost like a classical frieze that you might find on a sarcophagus or on the side of a building like the Parthenon. Poussin has separated the world of curves represented by the women and their water jugs from the world of lines and angles represented by the architecture above. Symbolically, he harmonizes the two worlds with the rectangular pillar on the right topped by a spherical globe. And he reiterates this theme of harmony by doubling the symbol of pillar and sphere in the distance behind. Poussin creates balance and interest in his painting by using what is called the rule of thirds. According to this rule, rather than just putting your subject in the middle, the center of the composition, an image is divided evenly into thirds, both horizontally and vertically. And the subject of the image it is placed either at the intersection of these lines or along one of the lines itself. 
this photographer has chosen to place his subject along the left-hand vertical in the first picture and along the right-hand vertical in the second. And this makes for an interesting picture. These examples show how the rock formation and the entire composition gains in interest when the tall rock formation, rather than being placed dead center, is moved to the left vertical line and the horizon is lowered to the bottom vertical, leaving two-thirds of the photo to the interesting sky and clouds. Here, in addition to giving his patron all kinds of poses of beautiful women, Poussin has placed the most important figure of Rebecca along the right-hand vertical and placed the buildings and architectural features along the top horizontal. In addition, he has created an area of interest on the left and draws our attention to this group of five women along the vertical and horizontal intersections. The girl with the jug on her head that you see on the left immediately engages us because she's looking right at us and draws us in. Her water jug is the only thing that breaks the horizontal line at the top and intrudes into the angular sphere. But follow the line down from her body to where the horizontal and vertical lines meet. The girl dressed in green and red is totally engrossed in what is going on between Rebecca and Eliezer. Her companion below, dressed in golden, yellow, and blue, is looking up at her and saying, for heaven's sake, pay attention. You're pouring water all over the ground. So Poussin is having a little fun here, as well as giving his patron the desired biblical scene of lovely young women in elegant poses with a variety of expressions. Who says you can't incorporate a little humor into this very classical subject? Thank you.